Hey, good afternoon. Welcome to the Medical Center Hour. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities here at the School of Medicine. We're delighted to welcome you here today, and the welcome extends not only to the human beings present, but also to three canines. So welcome. Our program today is called A Dog Walks Into a Nursing Home, What We Can Learn from Animals in a Medical Setting. Our guest today is Sue Halpern, about whom we will learn a bit more shortly. What happens when an extroverted six-year-old dog and her introverted human partner enter the local public nursing home as a therapy dog team? This was the question writer Sue Halpern nervously asked herself when she and her dog Kransky began their work at the Helen Porter Nursing and Rehabilitation Center in Middlebury, Middlebury Vermont. In our medical center hour today, Ms. Halpern revisits the remarkable experiences she and Kransky had over the six years with the nursing home residents, experiences that continued even after Kransky's own health declined. Ms. Halpern also speaks to the increasingly recognized value and demonstrated physical, psychological, and emotional, emotional benefits of introducing therapy animals into medical settings. And I should say, to any institutional setting for the sake of its inmates. For therapy, animals' benefits extend to staff, as well as to inmates, be they residents of nursing homes, patients in hospitals, students in medical schools, or other schools, or what have you. And these benefits accrue to the therapy teams also. A dog walks into the nursing home, and UVA Bookstore is here outside with copies that Ms. Halpern will uh, sign for you. Um, it's a delightful read. One strong thread through her book is the inquiry she informally made, prompted by her work with Pransky at the nursing home, into that ancient philosophical question, what makes a good life? She also gently interrogates the classical virtues, as these are manifested and enacted in real life settings, such as the nursing home, and in people's real and often difficult lives. <coughs> She explores, too, the ways that she and Pransky helped to bring the nurse to the nursing home folks, but then also received in full measure companionship, comfort, and a certain rich, mellow distraction, elements of a good life indeed. Sue Halpern is scholar in residence at Middlebury College in Vermont. She is a regular contributing writer to the New York Review of Books. You'll find a fuller bio, bio sketch of her in the handout you received. Um, again, we are happy to welcome Sue Halper, and we're also happy to welcome Bentley, Bella, and Bo, and their people, uh, who will be in the program today and then available uh, to meet and greet you um, after the program. Um, and now, without further ado, a dog walks into a nursing home. Or a person walks into a lecture hall. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you, uh, especially to Dr. Childers for inviting me here. Um, thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you also to our canine friends who are the most accomplished medical educators that I know. Um, so a few years ago, uh, many years ago actually now, um, uh, a few months after I finished my doctorate at Oxford, which was in political philosophy, uh, and one week before I was supposed to start a job at a foundation that was going to pay me a lot of money, at least I thought it would, at that point it was a lot of money, to work for three days a week so I could work on my writing the other days, um, I met this guy, this older guy, at a party. This is in New York City. And he came up to me and he said, um, you shouldn't take that job. Don't take that job. That's a terrible job. You'll only be working three days a week. You really should be working more than that. And, in fact, you should come and work for me. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but if you've done any graduate education, um, you understand that people who engage in that activity are basically masochists. <laughs> and so when he told me that I could come work for him for less money and more time, I said yes. <laughs> and that's how I found myself working at the Center for the Study of 
Society of Medicine at the College of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia University. Um, as part of my medical education, um, because I think you probably have figured out that as a political philosophy major and a person with a doctorate in political philosophy, I actually had no medical training. Um, I went on rounds. This was uh, at the height of the AIDS epidemic, and it was also at the height of a certain kind of drug epidemic, a crack cocaine epidemic. Um, Columbia is in the Washington Heights neighborhood of New York, and it was really the epicenter for both of those epidemics. The hospital, the medical school, which were basically in the same building, were across the street from maybe the biggest homeless shelter in New York City and probably at that point in the world. So the people coming into the hospital were presenting with very, very challenging issues. Um, for instance, um, should an IV drug user with a bad heart get a transplant? Um, these were hard questions to answer and no one really had a framework for answering them. And I started to think that our job at the center was not just to do research, um, but we were also teaching social medicine. And it became very clear to me that what we really all also needed to be teaching was ethics, or some way of thinking about these issues that were coming up. And so working with a couple of friends of mine who were young residents, we came up with a case-based <coughs> course that um, helped we thought these second year students um, begin to think about how to think about these things. Um, basically, we would bring in doctors and they would present a case and then we'd sit around and we'd talk about it and try to figure out how, how to handle these situations so that when they actually occurred, there was some way to think about them. So you probably think that I'm gonna tell you that it was when I was at Columbia um, that I first became acquainted with therapy dogs. Um, but in fact, I'm pretty sure that at a major New York City hospital in the late 1980s, there were no dogs. In fact, I saw no dogs. And, and that's because for the longest time, dogs were seen as vectors of disease, not as any, having any therapeutic value. Um, that dogs were used therapeutically during the wars, um, but it was all basically on an ad hoc basis, and um, it wasn't institutionalized in any way. So I left Columbia in the late 80s, uh, 1988, um, and throughout my writing life, I often returned to writing about medicine. But um, it wasn't until I came up with the idea for my fifth book, which is called Can't Remember What I Forgot, which is about, um, it's, a, it's a book about neuroscience, it's really a book about uh, normal memory loss. So when I came up with that idea, again, be it, being a writer, you often write about things you know nothing about. Uh, I knew nothing about uh, neuroscience. Um, so what I did was I attached myself to, um, to a big research uh, team at Columbia, and um, I spent two years there before I felt like I could ask a non-trivial question. I spent five years there altogether. Um, I spent so much time there that they forgot that I wasn't part of the team. There was a moment in time where we were out in the field and um, someone handed me a blood pressure cuff and told me to take the pressure of the person we were uh, dealing with. Um, and I, I hesitated for a moment, but then I realized I didn't actually know how to take anyone's blood pressure, so <laughs> I handed it back. But, but basically, um, I was there so long that um, there were moments when we were out in the field, uh, they were doing a very big genetic research in, uh, study, which ultimately I wrote about for the New Yorker. But while that was going on, if they needed someone to take notes or you know, do a recording of data, I was that person. So, so anyhow, um, you're probably now still wondering how to, how to connect the dots between that old guy at the party who made me quit my very cushy job before I had it, um, and the six years that I spent at the nursing home with Kransky. Um, and to tell you how that happened, I'm going to read a tiny bit from my book, but before I do that, um, I have to give you a disclaimer um, and some information. The disclaimer is that um, Kransky and I 
we're an N of, one, of two. So anything that I tell you about our experience is anecdotal. On the other hand, everything that we experienced is now being confirmed by the literature in the literature. So um, I'll talk about that literature a little bit later. Um, but, the, but the value, if you have to quantify it or datify it or, or legitimize it in some fashion, um, is becoming more and more robust. So let me give you two scene setters. First scene setter is the nursing home. The Helen Porter Nursing Home is a community-based public institution that is affiliated with a local community hospital. Um, they're a nonprofit and um, they basically survive on, on public funds, which is to say we're talking about kind of bare bones operations. Um, in fact, the hospital is now in such trouble that it's going to have to de-affiliate the nursing home and the nursing home might have to become a, pub, uh, a pri private institution owned by some corporation which will be its death. But at the moment, when I was there and still, um, it's a public institution, bare bones. You know, most people are, are supporting it through their um, Medicaid uh, payments. Um, people end up in this place because they're alone, because they can't take care of themselves, because they have nobody, um, and they don't have the financial resources to go into uh, an assisted living facility. So, in, the, in other words, the people who end up at the county nursing home are poor. Um, ironically, a couple of years ago, uh, an assisted living facility was built literally next door. So you can stand in the nursing home, stand in its, you know, uh, concrete walled, linoleum floored place that looks, you know, kind of like a college dorm, but but a college dorm that was built maybe 30 or 40 years ago, you can stand in there and look out at this very cushy, lovely place and understand how inequality affects healthcare. It's a sort of object lesson that's right in front of your face. So let me tell you a little bit about my dog, Ransky, um, who you're gonna be introduced to very shortly. Um, this, is, this, is her, uh, this is her money shot. Um, and um, this is us. So, um, Fransky was um, a very intuitive, very smart dog. She had a huge vocabulary. <coughs> I like to brag. Um, and um, she was also, she was just had gotten really, really bored. And um, it was getting obvious, and I knew I had to do something about it. And um, I thought she was really, really good as a therapy dog, because she was intuitive and she was kind. Um, and I thought, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll become a therapy dog, we'll become a team. Um, and then I looked into what that required, and um, the certification like that Bella has, I think, that Pransky and I got, was this 15-part thing that you had to go through. And, um, and I thought, okay, um, I guess we can do this, except that I realized that one of those, number four, um, was something that we were really not going to be able to be very good at, and that was walking on what they call a slack leash. So you can't have the dog, you know, kind of water skiing you down the hall. The dog has to be on this kind of nice, easy slack leash. And my dog grew up in the woods and um, spent no time on a leash, and she looked at the leash and she was offended by it. Um, and so, I realized, you know, we'd ha I'd have to train her to walk on a leash. We spent months doing this in our driveway. Um, I read everything that you could read about how to get a dog to walk on a slack leash, and I couldn't, I, everything they said, I tried. And um, basically, we would go out there, and as soon as she pulled, the, 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 the conventional wisdom was, as soon as the dog pulls, you stop. And the dog is going to be smart enough to come back to you and then understand that that's the way that it's supposed to be, is with that little little dip in the leash. Well, we would go out into the driveway and we would stop and we would stop. And that was not really that very effective way to teach her how to be on the leash. And so I realized we we're going to fail our test. And if, if you fail one part of this test, you fail the whole thing. So you won't get certified. And I thought, this was a shame. This dog was so good. She was so great at the nursing home. And um, so, uh, but I knew we were not going to pass. And so I made um, a desperate call to the nursing home. 
um, and I thought I would just read you this section that you would understand um, kind of how, how it all went. Um, six weeks into our training, when failure seemed assured, I made a call to the local nursing home. It was a faint, a fake to the right. I told the volunteer coordinator that I'd recently published a book about dementia and had spent some time with dementia patients in hospitals on both coasts and wanted to bring my incredibly well-behaved dog into her dementia unit to work with her patients. I hoped she'd jump at the opportunity to have us there, knocking aside the ever-narrowing hoop of therapy dog certification, which would then roll away out of sight. I was also counting on the fact that no one spends time in a nursing home unless they must, so of course she would welcome us. The volunteer coordinator passed me along to the activities director, a woman I'll call Jamie. I told her about Pransky, dropping adjectives like cute and calm and friendly and cute and sweet and gentle and cute. She does sound cute, Jamie said. I'm sure she'd be great. Hearing no hesitation in her voice, I was ready, already looking forward to leash-free afternoon jaunts through the woods with my dog again. As soon as you have your documentation, we'd be happy to have you. We like cute dogs, she said. Thwarted, I tried my last gambit. We want to work in the memory care unit, I said. I explained that I'd written a book about memory, hoping that my implied expertise would overcome her allegiance to protocol and that this would be the key that turned the lock that let us in. To be honest, there was another reason why I wanted to be assigned to the dementia unit. It scared me less. The paradox of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias is that as devastating as they are, they, their victims typically don't look sick until the end. Wow, Janie said cheerfully, that's amazing. I was back to feeling encouraged. You're like the fifth person this month who wants to volunteer in the special care unit. I was back to feeling discouraged. But no one else has a dog, I was feeling encouraged again. The thing is, Janie said, the special care unit already has a therapy animal, a cat who lives there. Pransky loves cats, I said, <laughs> which may or may not have been a lie. I had no idea. She'd never met a cat. <laughs> she definitely likes small rodents, which she'd chase through a meadow and sometimes catch. Oh, and there is a dog, a therapy dog, that visits sometimes, too, Janie added. But we'd love to have you two work with our general patient population. They haven't had a therapy dog in a long time. That's where we could really use help. As soon as you and Pransky get your certification, you can start. And so to recap, not only had I agreed to work with the old folks at the county nursing home, there would be no shortcuts to get there. It was back to slow walking for Pranny and me. So that's how it began. Um, and. Um, one of the questions that I get asked a lot, which is, what's the most surprising thing I found at the nursing home? Um, and I think that when people ask this question, it's because they already have a lot of preconceived notions about a nursing home. Um, they have a lot of images that come from the media, and most of them are pretty grim. And, you know, honestly, I had the same feelings, obviously. Um, one thing that is absolutely true about nursing homes is that they are filled with old people. Another thing is they have a lot of nurses. Um, and one of the jobs of those nurses is to make sure that people are both comfortable and that they're safe, which is to say that nursing homes are places that work very, very hard to try to eliminate risk. And if they don't do that, the consequences could be dire. Um, hence the reason to get your certification. So, you're probably wondering, we did pass the test. There was cheating. <laughs> you can read about it in the book. This is the, this is the real hard sell for the book. There was cheating, you can read about it. Um, Pransky actually never learned how to walk on a slack leash outside of the nursing home. But when we're in the nursing home, she was amazing. And the reason is, the reason why it's really important to get certified, and that is that you the, the process of this training that you do with your dog is a process basically of learning how to communicate very, very intently and intensely with your animal to the point where when we were there, this animal who 
normally, you know, had her own thing going, um, would do nothing without looking at me first. If we walked by a door, if we were going to go in, she wouldn't go in. She wouldn't pull the leash to go in. She would look at me, and I would nod, and we would go, or I wouldn't, and we would go on. Um, what this was really was this, this relationship became a relationship of trust. We were in an unfamiliar setting, though obviously it became more familiar. But she would look to me, I would look to her. I would know that I could trust her not to do anything silly. And she would know that I wasn't going to put her in a situation that was really not good for her. Um, there were exceptions. The very first day we were at the nursing home, um, I had been told that this was going to be an exhausting day for my dog, and I was like, you know, my dog goes for skis for like, you know, she skis with us for five, six hours at a time. This dog has a lot of stamina. After about the first hour, we walked into the room of a woman who was both, um, she was blind, and she had headphones on. She was listening to a book, so she was sitting in a chair, so she didn't know we were there. She couldn't hear us, and she couldn't see us. And she had really big balance issues, so her bed was basically on the floor. It was like a couple inches off the floor. And my dog saw this bed, and the first thing she did when she saw the bed was like, yes! And she just jumped into the bed and lay down. And uh, it was first day, so I, you know, totally illegal. Um, so that happened. Um, some strange music. Um, but, but let me tell you another, another thing that happened. So I trusted my dog so much that every once in a while in the nursing home I'd let her off the leash. Um, and um, one time I did this, um, and it was the day of, of the, there was always a religious service on Tuesdays when we were there. It was the Methodist service. The minister would come. They would sing hymns. It was very nice. And they often wanted the dog to be there. It just kind of was a nice thing for people. The minister loved the dog. So um, I heard the singing. I knew they were there. We were probably, I don't know, 10 feet from the door, and I dropped the leash. And the dog scooted in front and went into the room. And all of a sudden, I heard what I can only describe as like in the cartoons where you like have the cat chasing the mouse or however that works with like the like like dirt kind of flying all over in the bubble. That's the, that's what was going on. I could hear it. I could hear her, her feet on the linoleum. And then all of a sudden I heard this bah, bah, bah. And then I heard people laughing and laughing and laughing. And this was all taking place like, like very, very quickly. And when I went in there, um, the dog was chasing a lamb who was wearing diapers <laughs> because it was the Easter service. Yes. So, um, happy to report no one was hurt. The dog was going like underneath the wheelchairs. The, 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 the lamb was going under. I mean, everyone was just, it was great. Anyhow, um, that, that really woke people up. Um, anyhow, so it's very important to do training. It's probably very important not to drop the leash. Um, but you probably wonder, like, training to do what? You know, people would say to me, what do you do there? And for the longest time, I actually couldn't answer this question. Um, until I realized it was the wrong question. Um, because it wasn't really about what we did. I mean, we visited with people. <clears throat> we, you know, held their hand. We, we laughed with them. We talked about the Red Sox. Um, we talked about their friends. We talked, you know, whatever we did. We were, but, but it wasn't, we really didn't do anything. And I realized that was just the wrong way to think about it. It wasn't about doing, it was about being. What we did was show up. We were there. And when we were there, and the, you know, the, the lesson, if you've got to take a lesson away from this, and it is an important lesson if you're going to be in a medical setting, um, and it's a hard one, actually. It's an easy one for me to tell you. It's going to be a hard one for you to put into practice. What happened when we were there was that Pransky saw people for who they were not for what they weren't. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple pictures. Um, this is a woman who's basically, I mean, she loved my dog. She was paralyzed on one side, um, couldn't talk. Um, big memory issues here. <laughs> Two broken legs, not one. Um, uh, 
Um, <laughs> so, what happens when the dog? What happened when the dog was there? Was that people were able to be transported back to a time when they weren't there? Um, they could express themselves in ways that they couldn't when they didn't have this animal there. Um, we encountered a guy, they, they eventually let us go work at the memory care unit too, um, as long as we paid our dues in, with the general population, who we came to adore. But um, we ended up uh, spending every, every week, we'd spend a certain amount of time in the memory care unit, and there was this man there who would just sit by himself at a table, head down, not interacting, um, and I brought the you know I brought the dog over to him, and um, he asked me a question about the dog, and then he told me he had had he had had hunting dogs, and then we had this long conversation the first time about hunting, and about beagles and about how you know unruly they are, and um, for that time that we were there, this guy was alive in his memories. He was perfectly articulate. Um, you know, I don't, I wasn't there when we weren't there, so I can't tell you about him, but I, I can tell you what he was like when we approached, um, and it wasn't that. I think that, you know, when you have a dog in that setting, when we were there, when Pransky was there, um, she allowed people to uh, uh, have the identities that they had had prior to having their main identity be a person in a bed. Um, it's really hard when you see a person in a bed, and in fact, if, you're, if you are the person treating the person in the bed, not to be looking at the numbers, not to be looking at the medications, but it's really, really hard. And, and even not to be looking, you're looking at the person as they are right there, forgetting that they had some other life and, and some other identity and that there was some other person other than that sick person that you're dealing with and that they had histories and that's the thing the dog was like it was like having an oral historian along with me the dog would come along and people would tell their stories they would almost always talk about the dogs that they had had when they were young and that would generate some other set of stories and you know I learned so much about these people's lives and they were so happy to share them um, with me and with you know my my partner, um, and the other thing the other thing is that you know in this setting most people are touched by medical professionals they're poked and they're prodded, but we presented this option of a very rich, furry, soft, meandering, loving, tactile experience. You know you get a dog you can touch it and touch often brings people to another place. Um, you know, laying on of hands used to be part of medical practice, and you could argue that's because there was little else to offer to patients. But in this day, you know, right now, you know, with managed care and stuff, you know, there's almost no time to spend with patients. Um, and certainly very little time for the laying on of hands, and which seems quaint anyhow. Um, but the thing we know about touch is that it triggers um, the hormone oxytocin, and we know about oxytocin that it triggers the sense of well-being in people. Um, so it wasn't surprising to me that people in the nursing home, and I'm talking not just about the residents, but I'm talking a lot about the staff and even about the visitors, would always stop and run their hands <coughs> through the dog's fur. This was just a kind of a thing that would happen. Um, <clears throat> and I think when they did, you could see this sort of physiological effect. You could see people relax. And for the staff especially, it was like a little vacation. They worked very, very hard, um, very physical jobs in a nursing home. And to have an animal that they could bend down and talk to and play with was just a kind of, you know, motion, moment to breathe. Um, and and, and it, was, it was observable. Um, it's, I, I also read at one point that when you have a, a stimuli to focus on, like in this case, this dog, it also has a calming effect. And I saw that with, with people in the nursing home particularly. Um, let, me, let me give you a couple of examples of this from, from our experience. Um, the first was this, this man who um, was, had been a dairy farmer. Middlebury is 
in Vermont, which is a very agricultural state, and this is this nursing home is in the sort of the agricultural valley, um, and so almost everybody in the nursing home either had worked on a farm or had grown up on a farm, and so they were very well acquainted with animals. And animals, you know, once you're in a nursing home, that's it. You know, you might have raised horses or cow cows or whatever, but you're now dis basically divorced from that part of your life. So this guy had been had a herd of like I think 80 Holsteins in his farm. He had done, worked there all his life. Um, he was when I encountered him. He wasn't in the memory unit. He was in the general unit. Um, he didn't talk. He didn't talk at all. He spent the day looking at the TV uh, in the activities room. And but I would make it a point of you know going to the activities room, having the dog come, and he would touch the dog and. Um, that would be that. Uh, one day we showed up. Um, I put his hand on the dog, as I always did. And he looked at me and he said, she got a haircut. And I didn't say it, but I wanted to say, you can talk. But I didn't. I just said, yeah. And you know, we talked. He, was, he, he remained a man of few words. Um, sometime later, he was in the same activities room with another guy, and they were watching a doctor show. And we walked in, and I said, hey, what's, what's on the TV? What's that show about? And he just looked up at me, a man of few words, and he just said, sex. <laughs> I, feel like I felt like I, I'd broken through. We were, we were good friends. Um, another example of, of the sort of therapeutic, our, our N of two, our therapy uh, adventures. Um, there was this woman, also growing up on a farm, um, still, the farm was still in the family. Um, she often talked to me about her horses and sometimes her dogs. She loved my dog. And every week when we showed up, she would be at the um, entrance with some bit of food often from the dining hall which she'd wrapped up in, in a napkin which was now stuck to this bit of food which my dog would have to eat. She didn't mind. Um, anyhow, she, she met us every week. Dog loved her. She loved the dog. And then one week she wasn't there. And um, I thought she had died, but I heard that she, in fact, um, had had a massive stroke, and she was in the hospital. And the next week, she wasn't there as well. And the third week, uh, I walked in, and I was greeted um, by the woman, Jeannie, uh, her former nemesis, who told me that the, um, that the family had requested us to go visit this woman who had, was back. Um, so we went. And um, she was in bed. She would, her eyes were closed. She was writhing. I've never seen anything like it. She was just like flopping from one side of the bed to the other side of the bed to the other side of the bed to the other side of the bed. It was very disconcerting. It was very scary. And it was very upsetting to everybody, obviously. Um, I took the dog and I put her on a chair. The bed was elevated um, so she could see her friend. Often when we were visiting, Paretsky would get into bed. It was this is probably not like kosher, but the um, nursing home was very keen on having the residents be able to tell us what they wanted to do, and this woman always wanted the dog with her. So the dog was up and staring at this woman as she went back and forth, and um, she looked at me, the dog, because normally she would get in bed. And I said to the family, do you want the dog in the bed with this woman? Which was kind of a stretch, because I didn't really know what was going to happen. And, and they said they, they would. So we lowered the railing, and the dog went in the bed. And she lay down, she sort of lay down like flat, kind of her end to end. She was like stretched out. And this woman would just go bam into her, bam into her, bam into her. And she didn't move. And I was just like, like what? What's going to happen? You know, what's going to happen here? And at at some point, the the woman, the daughter of the woman in the bed, took the dog, took her mother's hand, grabbed her mother's hand, and she kind of went pie and put it on the dog. And she said, "Mom, the dog is here." Not like Pransky is here, whatever. Mom, the dog is here. And all of a sudden, this woman stopped moving. She stopped for maybe a second or two, or three, and she opened her eyes. And it was just this moment of absolute, kind of miraculous calm. And everyone in the room was like, what just happened? 
and then she started again. But for that moment, she had her mother, this woman had her mother back. She had her back. I took the dog home, and she slept for five hours. She was done. She was done. But if I ever needed sort of an example of what the value of this interaction was, it was right there. And um, I was very proud of my dog at that moment. Um, so, right now, dogs and other animals, I've heard ferrets, um, rabbits, I don't know, but mostly dogs, um, are being studied systematically really for the first time in these, in these medical settings. And they're often in these different modalities. And what they're finding is that the, um, the, the findings seem to dovetail with each other no matter sort of where they're um, being studied. So, for instance, um, therapy dogs have been showed in controlled studies to enhance the socialization of children with, with autism. Um, in one study, they, they, did, um, they had the children interact with therapy dogs, and, the, and then they also had them interact with stuffed dogs, stuffed animals, not dogs that are stuffed, but toys. Um, and what they were able to, to measure was um, uh, better communication skills with these um, kids in the presence of the dog, which did not happen in the presence of the stuffed animal. Um, so that, and they also, I don't know how you quantify happiness, but they were able to say that the dog made the kids more happy. Um, there was another study of the anxiety levels in, um, it was 230 hospitalized psychiatric patients. Um, and they had them have a routine uh, therapy session you know, with a therapist. And then they had uh, them do a therapy session with um, an animal-assisted therapy session. Um, and the researchers were able to find statistically significant reductions um, in anxiety scores after interacting with the animals. Sorry for all of you who are going to be therapists. Um, we should go out and get a dog right now. Um, um, then there was a study of people who had recently undergone um, hip replacements. Um, and um, they had um, people who were visited by therapy dogs and people who, who weren't. Um, the people who were visited by the therapy dogs uh, required half the pain medication um, that the ones who were not required. Um, so, you know, you could say that, you know, just giving people attention when they're in a kind of distressed situation or when they're sick um, is enough to make them feel better. But if you thought that, you would actually probably be wrong. Um, it's not just attention. The animal actually matters. Um, I'm going to tell you about a study, but I, I just want to say that um, in, in, the, in my research and in my book, and um, I, I spent a lot of time reading and thinking about um, Temple Grandin, the uh, autistic zoologist, um, who really understands animals, you know, probably she would say better than people. Um, but what I think happens maybe when you're sick and in this situation is that you understand animals better or you understand that they understand you better. Um, in part because they're not judgmental, um, in part because they're willing just to be, um, in part because they don't ask a lot of invasive questions. Um, so there's this study um, at UCLA of people who are in heart failure. Um, and there were three groups of people. Um, the people who are in heart failure who got visited by a therapy dog team, so a dog and a person. The people who got visited by uh, a regular volunteer, i.e. a person without a dog. Um, and the, the unfortunate people who got no attention whatsoever. Um, and here's what they found. Con the, compared with the controls, the volunteer dog group, so the people who are visited by people with dogs, um, had significantly greater decreases in systolic pulmonary artery pressure during and after the intervention. Compared with the volunteer group only, the dog group had significantly greater decreases in epinephrine levels and neoepinephrine levels during and after the intervention. 
And after the intervention, the volunteer dog group um, had the greatest increase in anxiety scores um, than either the ones only with volunteers or the ones in the control group. Um, obviously, you don't make um, you can't make inferences from one study, but um, it's pre it's a pretty robust study, um, and it suggests that if you add a dog into this setting, um, you get better outcomes. Um, let me tell you about another study. Um, this one happened pretty recently, and it was done at the University of um, British Columbia, um, and they were looking at homesick first-year students. So obviously these weren't kids in you know crisis, but they you know they could potentially be kids in crisis, right? So um, so they, they they had a study in which half of the students were able to <clears throat> have. Uh, eight weeks of dog therapy, um, which meant they um, interacted with a dog and the dog's handler, and then they also got to talk with other kids who were interacting with dogs and dog's handlers. So it was a fairly socialized event. Um, and then they told the other half of the kids that their time would happen at the end, that they would, they would get to have the dogs after this two-month period was up. I, I don't know if they ever did. It seems a little like a trick, but, but in any case, the um, the, the people who got to hand, uh, handle the dogs and play with the dogs and um, be with the dogs experienced um, markedly lower rates of homesickness. Their homesickness um, pretty much disappeared and their satisfaction with their lives went up. Um, conversely, the kids who didn't get to interact with the dogs and the people um, had greater sense of homesickness as these two months went on. Um, and increased feelings of alienation. Um, so, you know, it might not seem consequential when you're talking about homesickness and kids, but in fact, what was really interesting um, about that was that um, they also found, they, were, they interviewed kids who dropped out of school, not this, this cohort, but they interviewed kids who, who left school, and they found that one of the main reasons why kids were dropping out was because they felt alienated and not at home. And the opposite happened with the kids who were with the dogs. Um, there's a, there's a, some interesting movement in, in the kind of nursing home space with trying to make nursing homes more like homes. And one of the ways that they do that is by having animals in those settings. So, um, which makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Um, they also can like order drinks and things like that, which, believe it or not, makes a difference. Um, one group that really hasn't been studied very much for sort of obvious reasons are the handlers, people like me and these guys who have their dogs here. Um, you know, why? Why bother? But um, a couple of years ago, the Department of Defense allocated about half a million dollars to study the effects of therapy dogs um, in various settings. And one of the things that they did was they funded a study of um, veterans with PTSD. And, they, and, the, and the study was that they asked them to train dogs to become therapy, to become mobility assistance dogs for other uh, veterans who had uh, a disability. So they were doing this task for the greater good, for their fellow veterans, teaching these dogs. But you know the, the, the people who were doing the study were very interested in what the effect of this training would be on the people doing the training. These people, these men and women who were in severe distress. And you know, not surprisingly, it had these massive therapeutic uh, benefits. Um, people who were hypervigilant became less vigilant. People who had trouble um, making eye contact, reading emotional cues, became better at that. Um, people who were anxious all the time became less anxious. Um, people who couldn't communicate their feelings with their families, who couldn't communicate, um, became better at communicating. Um, so, you know, it was a win-win for everybody in that study. And, and something sort of similar happened to me. Um, you know, when, when Prancy, Prancy got sick at year 12 of working in the nursing home, 
She got lung cancer, which is a really, really rare cancer um, in dogs. Less than 1% of cancers in dogs are lung cancer. Um, and she had part of her lung removed. Um, and it was a very long recovery. And um, while she was recovering, you know, everyone in the nursing home was very concerned. Um, and they sent cards, and they sent presents, and they called. And they often called on Tuesday, which is the day we would show up. And um, that was pretty great. Um, and they always wanted to know when we'd be back. And so, of course, you know, it just did not motivate the dog to go back, but it kind of motivated me to get the dog back. Um, which we did, and when we went back, it was like a big homecoming, and it was really amazing because people really believed she was going to come back, and and they had, there were so many people who had treats waiting for my dog, um, and because she was sick, I let her have them all, uh, <laughs> um, which made her very happy, um, um, but she she died about a year ago, eleven months ago today, in fact, who's was counting, um, and when she died. I, the outpouring of grief from this place and this outpouring of concern for me from this place was tremendous. And it wasn't, you know, it was the people in the beds and the people who cared for the people in the beds. Um, you know, it was pretty remarkable, I thought. Um, and again, I mean, if I needed any evidence to understand what effect this dog had, there, there it was, like staring me in the face. It's staring me in the face, you know, every time I sit down at my desk because there's this huge card that they had made of, of photographs of the dog in the nursing home with like lots of things that people wrote. Um, everyone, in fact. Um, and it was just yet another demonstration that um, what this dog, what a dog in a, in a medical setting can do is allow people not to not be sick, but to allow them not to be sick people, to allow them to be people, to just be. That's what the dog can do. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna end this by just reading one more section from the book, um, and then you can ask me questions if you have them. Um, and the section is the very very beginning of the book, um, which is the prologue and the you know dirty secret of all writers is that you write the beginning of the book last. So um, so I wrote this after I basically had um, written the book. So. If you don't mind, I'll read it. Um, Pransky, my soon-to-be 10-year-old dog, is lying on the living room couch, her body filling it end to end, for though she's not a big dog, she is double-jointed, which means that her hips lay out flat. If I weren't typing this, I'd be stretched out next to her, because I'm tired too, as I often am on Tuesday afternoons. Every other weekday of the week, Pransky is a carefree country dog who operates by instinct, roaming the meadow around our house. But Tuesday mornings, we spend time at the county nursing home, going door to door, dispensing canine companionship and good cheer. Working at the nursing home requires us to pay attention. Pransky to me, to her surroundings, and to the people she is meeting, and me to her, our surroundings, and to the people we are meeting. After three years, you'd think we would have gotten tougher or more robust, but it's never happened, and it probably never will. When I first considered training Pransky to be a therapy dog, she was in her late adolescence. Dog years being what they are, she is now about the same age as most of the people in the nursing home. Even so, the words work and walk still get her to her feet in a unit of time that is less than a second. Is she better at her job, more empathetic, now that she too is of a certain age? I doubt it. I doubt it because I don't think she could be more empathetic. As foreign as the nursing home environment was to both of us when we first started visiting, it was a little less to me since my first job was at a medical school and a teaching hospital where I sometimes went on rounds. I was in my late 20s with a newly minted doctorate, hired to teach ethics to second year students. This should tell you all you need to know about how seriously that place took the ethical part of medical education. At that age, I had about as much experience with the complicated ethical dilemmas of sick people and their families as the second years in my class had treating sick people and dealing with those ethical dilemmas, which is to say, basically, none. <laughs> Still, reality was not our mandate. We were supposed to consider what might happen if, and then think through the best, the best then. 
The one thing you need to know about modern philosophy is that the operative word in the previous sentence is best. The first thing we had to do in that class was figure out what it meant. Was it what the person in the bed said she wanted? What the doctor wanted? What the hospital's risk manager wanted? What the church, whatever the church was, wanted? What the partner wanted? What the other doctor wanted? What the parents wanted? What the children wanted? Sorting out what was best was, to say the least, challenging. For guidance, we read works by Kant and Aristotle and Bentham that were harder to get through than the textbooks on human anatomy and organic chemistry, and for my students who were itching to get into the clinic, largely beside the point. While I didn't think for a minute that an abstract principle like Kant's categorical imperative was going to actually lead to the right decision on whether or not to give a new heart to a homeless man, it seemed like a reasonable idea in a place where right answers were not often as black and white as they might appear, to inject some of these notions into the future doctors' heads. If ideas like this could become part of their met mental landscape, then in the future, confronted with that homeless man, they might see the terrain with greater definition. Historically, when people look for guidance on how to conduct their lives, they turn to philosophy or religion or both. That's less true now as former religious affiliations drop away and academic philosophy becomes more and more arcane. It's not that people are less inclined to examine their lives or seek wisdom. It's just that they are more likely to look for it in other places, in support groups or radio call-in shows, from life coaches, on the internet, in books, or in my case, inadvertently, with my dog, in a nursing home. When Pransky and I started working at Helen Porter, I expected to learn things. How could I not? Though what those things would be, I didn't know. I assumed I learned something about old people and about the therapeutic value of animals in a medical setting, and about myself in that setting, which was alien and not a little scary. What I found myself learning about quickly sorted itself into a template that anyone with a Catholic education, which would not include me, would recognize as the seven virtues, love, hope, faith, prudence, justice, fortitude, restraint. It should be said that the Catholics didn't have a corner on virtue in general, or that in these seven in particular, they just happen to enumerate them and in a sense popularize them. So when we think of virtue, we tend to think in sevens. And the virtues remain as guides not only to good conduct, but to our better and possibly happier, more harmonious, more humane selves. Happiness, as it happened, was the dominant emotion for both Pransky and me when we were at the nursing home, strange as that sounds and strange as it was. I didn't go there to be happy any more than I did to learn about hope or fortitude or to think about courage and faith, but that's what happened. You could say I was lucky, and in fact, by landing at County, I was lucky. It happened to be blessed with tremendous leadership, a devoted staff, and a larger community that embraces rather than isolates it, and I wouldn't presume to, that it was comparable to any other nursing homes. But I do believe that in settings like nursing homes, as well as hospitals and hospices, and any other place where life is in the balance, we get to the essentials, which is what the virtues are. More than luck was at work, too. My dog was at work, and she brought it to it a lightness and easiness that seemed to expand outward and encompass everyone she encountered. We often talk about getting out of our comfort zone, but rarely about entering someone else's. Pransky made that possible. With her by my side, and sometimes in the weed, I was able to be a better, more responsive, less reticent version of myself. Anyway, I'm going to end there. Um, and I hope you ask questions. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and you can stay right there. And um, we have a couple of mics we'll bring around. Um, and you can ask questions uh, or offer comments. Um, I would ask you please to identify yourself when you have the mic. Um, and uh, John, you have somebody there candidate already. Thank you. Hi, Justin Mutter. I'm um, a fellow in geriatrics here. Um, thanks a lot for your presentation. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm curious if you have any thoughts as you put your political philosopher hat back on in terms of how to democratize uh, this experience for folks who are in nursing homes. Um, if you want to comment on that. Um, that's an interesting question about democratizing. Um, you know, one of the things that, uh, I, I didn't go to the nursing home thinking I was going to write a book, even though I'm a writer. Um, but 
I felt like after a certain point in time that it was a really important um, thing to do to get the message across that this is a really easy thing to do. I mean, aside from the fact that I couldn't teach my dog how to walk on the leash, but, but in general, you know, people would say, oh, you know, it's so great that you do this. And I would say it's, you know, two hours out of my life a week. It's not a lot. Um, and so I think one of the, the things that's necessary is for ordinary people to realize that this isn't, you know, it isn't that hard to do. Um, it makes a huge difference, um, but it doesn't require a tremendous amount of, of kind of capital in any fashion. Um, it just requires some time. Um, and so um, I think it's more about getting, getting the word out that it's, it's not that hard it's not that hard to do, um, and um, making people realize. I think the other the other sort of side of it is people are very hesitant to go into nursing homes. They're scary places, and I think um, so. Sort of demystifying that is also important. So maybe I hope that helps. Hello, I really enjoyed uh, your presentation today. I'm Stephanie, and this is Bo, and we've been coming up here for almost two years now, I think. We started right when Bo was two. It was on my bucket list to give back. My mother was a nurse in an emergency room, and I have three kiddos. My youngest has autism, and we were on a wait list for years for a service dog for my son, and we took it upon ourselves. We have a small horse farm down the way that we would train a service dog, and uh, it was probably the hardest job that I've ever undertaken in terms of passing certain levels because we both certainly were accredited in um, previous uh, accreditations for Bo. We rescue Bo. Um, it doesn't have to be a, you know, a, a registered dog. He came to us at 11 months old and was wide open. And I can't thank UVA Hospital Medical Systems enough for um, letting, where, how many of us, 14 teams? 18. 18 teams to come in here in this facility and spread um, good cheer, because if I'm coming in for an appointment, I can come in and be right on time, and if I have Bo, I better plan 30 minutes ahead. <laughs> I'm invisible when I walk through that lobby, no, no, but um, the minute anybody sees Bo, it automatically, you can see the change in their shoulders, whether it's a staff member, um, you know, a family uh, patient. And uh, I agree, absolutely, it, if we can have five minutes with somebody here, whether it's a staff member or a patient, to forget why they're here, we've done our job that day. And um, just also to your comment you made many times throughout Everybody's like, oh, I want to be a therapy dog. You know, I get pets and treats and all that, but it's exhausting for the dogs. Um, they love it, but um, if you think about all of us being on our best behavior um, all the time, it's exhausting. And um, But we love our work here, and um, I hope to get another one in play short, shortly. And I think it's incredible work for anybody that's out there pushing into any medical facility. Thank you. Other comments, questions? I should just, um, I'll, I'll end by telling you this. Mm -hmm. I, I gave a talk once and um, I, I, they opened it up to questions and this woman um, came up and she told this very long story. It was going on and on and on. It was all about this dog that she had rescued and then it turned out that she had this dog, uh, had to go across the country and get an operation and she didn't want to put it under the plane so she, forged a thing that said the dog was a therapy dog, and, but then she got on the plane and the person sitting next to her said, what kind of therapy dog? And, and she said, she couldn't think all of a sudden, she was like, anger management. Um, <laughs> um, anyhow, she told this story at, 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 a, at a reading that I gave, and then this other guy stood up and he said, he came up to the, shambled up to the um, microphone and he said, well, one time I needed to go across town and my car was broken. So I needed to take the dog with me. So I put in some dark glasses and a harness on the dog, and I went on the bus. And it was all going well until a blind man got on the bus and sat next to me with his dog. And then I had to get off the bus. So think about that. If you have anything you want to confess, you can talk to me later. <laughs>
and again, Sue Halpern will be um, up at the table at the um, upstairs entrance um, with books, and um, and the dogs will be there too. Hi, I'm Kim, and I'm the volunteer coordinator for our therapy teams. And I just want to just kind of go back is in terms of a thank you to each and every one of them for coming. And um, the beauty is that the dogs really don't have an agenda. Um, they're there just for pure joy. And, um, and it's just really a pretty amazing, you know, what they do. And we're almost at the point now, and it happens, where patients will actually call down from their patient room and say, oh, if there's a, a dog in the house, could you send somebody up? I'd love to see them. So now they're advocating for themselves <laughs> for the therapy, which is even awesome, really awesome. And, um, and it just kind of comes around like that. And I just think that's, it's just a remarkable program. It has grown uh, for, over the years, it has ebbed and flowed, I guess, in terms of participants. But we've been around for a very long time, over 20-some years, but it's, I think, because there's more knowledge about the benefits of uh, animals in a healthcare setting um, and the quality of outcome that patients do get, uh, I think it's just becoming more popular. But um, we're growing, so we're very excited. And we're excited that you came today, too. That just helped verify even more. And I am grateful that UVA, where I work, that they support this. This is absolutely remarkable. Thank you. There is uh, a list of resources in the handout that you got uh, at the entrance, and you can uh, talk with, with folks afterwards. Um, I invite you to come next week to Medical Center Hour. It'll be here, but it'll be partnered also with Medical Grand Rounds. We have a tree biologist here who is going to talk to us about after the fall, she fell out of a tree. Um, after the fall, disruption, recovery, and resilience. Um, I'd also like to call your attention to a program Thursday night this week, 8 o'clock p.m., free at the Paramount Theater, Theater of War, with uh, a director and actors from New York in a public town hall forum, uh, starting with some scenes from Greek tragedy, but then evolving into a conversation about the visible and invisible wounds of war and how all of us in the community can help. Theater of War, and you can see the um, flyer outside. Again, thank you to Sue Halpern for walking into our medical center. Uh, she has a new dog. Um, she didn't tell us about that. Maybe she will out there. Um, but we thank her. We thank the, the other dogs and their people who came today and the ones who are here working throughout our medical center. Thank you all for being here.